typical Bruce County fashion. Sorry. Uh, we usually try to be, be, I guess you would call it, uh, leave room for uh, spontaneity in our crop tours. <laughs> Some people might call it unorganized. <laughs> so we're trying to stick to that fashion. Um, so just rules of engagement to start with, being on Zoom. Uh, in general, everyone is already muted, so that's good. Mute your mic unless you want to speak or uh, ask a question. If you do have a question, you could uh, use the little raise your hand um, thing at the bottom. I think it's under reactions. There's a little button called reactions and you click on raise your hand or else you can type into the chat box and we'll be monitoring the chat box for any questions. So we're gonna stop periodically through the presentation for some discussion time. Uh, we feel that interactive is much better for learning for everyone. So we wanna hear your experiences. A lot of this is just our experiences. We're not professionals, we're just learning as we go. And um, so we thought it'd be a good starting point to just share our experience um, and use that as a jumping point for conversation. So uh, I think we all sort of felt getting into strip fill that, um, that there's a lot of tillage demonstrations and that type of thing that are done on the perfect ground and it makes it look quite doable but there's also as you start into it there's lots of hurdles and lots of things to consider and uh, different soil types so it's not a silver bullet by any means there's lots of things to consider so we hope to address some of those tonight So I'm gonna just start up our presentation here. Sorry about that. So uh, we want to thank uh, the sponsors for our virtual crop series, our crop walk series. Uh, they're listed on this slide. So thank Sorry, you. can everyone see our screen? Yes, we can. Yes. So they're listed on the screen on this slide. So I'll just leave that up for a minute so you can have a look. And. Um, I'll also mention we lost this slide, but I'm going to just mention uh, in lieu of uh, expenses for a crop tour that we normally have, we've made a hundred dollar donation to the Bruce County 4 H, and we would encourage you to do the same if you feel like it. Uh, so I'll just give you the email and uh, Lori, would you type it into the chat box? It's brucecounty4h at gmail.com. And that will be in the chat box if you want. So just quickly our agenda for tonight. Uh, we're going to touch on planting soybeans into cereal rye. And then we will be moving into after that we'll have a bit of discussion time and then we'll be moving into strip fill. Okay, so planting soybeans into cereal rye. I'm Paul Lag, by the way, and this is Thomas beside me. Um, so anyways, Thomas is gonna take it away for the start. Hello everybody, I'm Paul Sparrow. We've been experimenting with planting soybeans green now for five or six years. Uh, this year we thought that we keep rolling our acres for doing that way. I really enjoy 
playing green and I say so far I don't feel like I'm losing yield to it so can add some soil health and plant my beans it uh, works out pretty good so this year what we did with this field that's pictured is uh, we had uh, corn strip tilled into this farm it's a very light probably our lightest farm that we have so we had corn strip tilled into that we had a green cover crop and then we strip tilled into it then in the fall we harvested the corn and we broadcast 50 pounds of cereal rye along with 100 pounds of potash when one quick pass with the RTS and left that that was uh, mid-November we then uh, came back this spring and we drilled through it with uh, our John Deere no-till drill we placed 170,000 seeds the acre on 15 inch rows uh, 75 pounds of mez and some humic acid in furrow with it we let the beans, or sorry, the rye grow for approximately four days after planting, just to let it recover from going through. I wanted to make sure I got a good kill. And it was still very short at the time. So then we came back and killed. We did not roll this field. Traditionally, we always do roll, but it was quite short. And on the lighter land, we found that if we roll it, it does impact our emergence on the soybeans. So we left it. Uh, this farm, we keep on three, three year rotation corn, soybeans, wheat, and we always try to follow the wheat with uh, past manure. Uh, prior to purchasing this farm about eight years ago, it was a corn on corn farm and we've added rotation back into it and we've been seeing some really good things. This is some shots taken yesterday in the farm now. Uh, it's just, oh, second. It's there just, we are. Our internet's uh, limiting here, so the videos are going to be a little bit laggy. Our apologi apologies, and uh, maybe it's a good, a good uh, push to uh, push for rural <laughs> high-speed internet for everyone. Hopefully there's some politicians that see this. <laughs> <laughs> so this is uh, some pictures I took yesterday of the farm in soybeans. It, uh, to date, in our ownership of the farm, this best crop of soybeans it's had at this point in the year. It's a long way from harvest yet, but uh, excellent root growth, uh, great nodulation, and a nice even crop of beans. Okay, so Paul Lag here and uh, just farm with, with our family near Chesley, Chesley, Ontario in Bruce County. So this field that's pictured, it had corn in 2020. Um, after harvest, we broadcasted just common cereal rye at 60 pounds per acre on November 12th. Um, it was terminated one day before planting and planted with uh, 3665 interplanter on 15 inch rows. But we also plant with a John Deere 1890 drill on 15 inch rows. So we've done a bit of both. Um, but this is no tilling right in between corn, the corn stalks. And we do have upgraded closing wheels on the planter. So just showing kind of a snapshot of what this farm looked like. March 23rd, when we had that snow melt. Uh, looks like virtually nothing um april 10th we're getting a bit of growth and then march 7th all of a sudden the farm was a uh, wall of green and then it was planted on may 20th so um we did a bit of a termination timing project here as well on very small scale but this farm had variable rate p and k broadcast before planting uh, variable rate soybeans, and they were planted on May 20th. And so we left a strip alive, basically just to compare with slug feeding, because that's probably one of the biggest issues that we've seen with cereal rye. And then the strip was crimper rolled on June 9th when the beans were unifoliate and first foliate, first trifoliate. How big was the rye at that point? 
the rye the rye was about sorry i meant of pictures in there the rye was probably four feet tall by the time we we rolled it so so what we've learned um pay attention to termination timing that um probably one of the biggest things it's it's you see it when people take cereal rye off for um for feed if if it, they're taking it off in the last week of May, often their eye is so big and it's taking so much moisture. When we get a dry spring like this year, um, you struggle to get enough moisture. Um, so this spring, that's why I started burning down ahead of the planter, um, just to make sure that we had enough moisture. Um, the opener does a much better job in green rye than yellow or dying rye. Slugs can be a big issue for sure. And if the rye is big, like uh, Thomas and I both have had experience planting into kind of like five, six foot rye. And the biggest issue if you don't roll it down is the shading effect of the beans. So the, if the rye gets big, I would say you want it flat on the ground. So, and we just want to see um, what, uh, what issues and successes have others had if they planted green. Has anyone had any experience planting green into cereal rye? Nothing? <laughs> We're all learning, okay. Just well, wait, wait a sec, there might be. I would think there'd be one or two that have tried it anyways. Richard, what you, I know that you've done it. What has your experience been? <laughs> Joan, I th are you speaking? We can't hear you. No, I'm just talking to Robert. <laughs> sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I thought you were going to contribute. Sorry. Okay, well, we'll carry on. We can come back to that when people are less shy later. Yeah. Um, how's that? You in here? That's, it's Gerard here. Uh, I tried it a couple of years ago. Can anybody hear me? Yeah. Okay, anyhow. I, uh, I tried it a couple of years on about 10 acres. The rye was about... Now, this wasn't cereal rye. This is an, was annual rye. And it was about uh, four or five inches. I terminated it uh, just a day or two after I sowed it. But... I had an insect and different issues with it that it set it back some. Uh, that's my experience. Last fall, I did a lot of acres, blew on about 35 pounds of cereal rye and did not get one sprout on any of it. Uh, I just, I have no idea what happened, but uh, uh, zero success with just blowing uh, cereal rye on, on the corn. And that was, what would have been mid October last fall? Yeah. So, like we had an early fall, so we get uh, we had the corn off, and there should have been lots of time and moisture for the cereal rye, but don't know zero success with it. Uh, what what kind of rate did you use for last fall? I, I used thirty five pounds. I figured I, I should have had these catch so. I figured I should get something with it, uh, but uh, zero, zero luck on that. Uh, this fall, I'm going to drill it in and try that. Uh, actually, on the on-farm research part, we'll, we'll be drilling it in, and we'll also uh, be drilling it in on my compaction plot. Uh, just to add a little bit of a note, we've tried interceding annual rye for a number of years some years we've had great success and other years i've had 
zero, zero uh, success, so we're dropping that out of the rotation. But uh, I would like to uh, firmly, I'm thinking that I'm gonna have to drag that bloody drill across the field to try and get this, uh, the serial guy going in the ball. Perfect, thanks for sharing. Anyone else? Okay, we're gonna carry on then. Technical difficulties, hang on. There we go. Okay, we are going to move on to our strip tillage portion. Um, so some things we're going to talk about is equipment used, fertilizer applied, and how we're applying it, spray programs, and uh, lots of other stuff. We'll just get so uh, to start off. Well, I'm Adam Devisser, and so our farm is very much farms, farm with my family. Um, we have turkeys, so we have turkey manure, that's our main source of fertility. somewhere between three and a half and five tons an acre of turkey manure. Um, then we would put, uh, as far as our fertilizer program, we put dry starter with the planter um, between 100 and, a, and 150 pounds of uh, 24, 18, nine blend uh, with a bit of sulfur and zinc. Um, so actually that, um, we have a batter stat tempo planter, so a high speed planter. Um, and we messed around for a while with the two by two opener and we could never get it to work the way we wanted to. So we we're actually just dropping our dry fertilizer um, in front behind the row cleaners and in front of the uh, seed openers. And the seed openers are incorporating it for a horse closing system that also has quite a bit of incorporation. Um, so as far as the strip tiller, we are, uh, we have a coon gladiator, three point hitch strip tiller. Um, we use shanks in the fall and we've made a twin polter um, replacement for the shank for the spring for refreshing, uh, refreshing strips. So I think we've got some video here. They are a little bit um, choppy, so just bear with us and we'll talk about them more after. I'm Adam DeVisser. Uh, so this is our first full year of strip tilling. Uh, so this particular field, it was mid-October and conditions were a bit wet. We ended up with a strip you are. So this particular field, it was mid-October and conditions were a bit wet. So we ended up going with the coon shank machine and we went through one pass at four inches and ended up going a second pass at six inches to try and build a decent berm. So then the spring with coulters we refreshed. And so uh, we're just looking at where we missed the berm coming in with the planter compared to where we hit the berm. So you can see, um, where there's no berm, it was a bit wet and it slotted. And so the, the berm definitely dried things out. We got in here sooner than no tilling. And so if we look at the root system, this one is, uh, the one I'm holding up is it's 
off the strip by a bit. Not the worst, but it's off by a bit, and this plant is on the strip. So we figure it's uh, half a leaf, half a leaf behind where it's off the strip. And you can see the roots are a bit smaller, and it just gets worse the further off the strip you are. It was too wet for that. Okay, so sorry for the video. Um, basically, yeah, it's obvious if you miss the strip, uh, you're gonna run into issues. And it depends on how fit the soil is, how much issue you're gonna have. Um, and also on your planter setup. So we are, uh, we are using Delta Force and that helps quite a bit. Uh, if we miss the strip, we get extra, it automatically puts the extra down pressure in. And so we're still getting down to depth. And uh, so the issue becomes if it's too wet, we have slotting issues. Um, so it's important to hit the strip. That's easier said than done. Okay. Uh, in this video, how I tried turning the sound up a little bit. Are you able to hear the videos okay? And are they of any value or do we not bother with the videos? They're good. I can hear you talking clearly. Okay. Okay. And we'll just talk about them after they play. Apologize for the poor video. We're limited by internet. This is uh, where we did our root dig. So for the cover crop, what we did was after the wheat came off, we uh, no-tilled in oats at 50 pounds and radish at two and a half pounds an acre. And uh, we didn't spray it off last fall. So what you see here is volunteer wheat and oat residue. So in retrospect, we probably would have or should have maybe sprayed off the volunteer wheat last fall or earlier this spring. We left it growing because we didn't know if it was going to be a wet spring. And maybe it, was, maybe it was a wet spring, but it's certainly not wet anymore. So uh, in retrospect, we probably should have sprayed it off, but this is what it is. Um, so I think we have a bit of competition from, from the volunteer wheat. So, we so that video just shows um, the competition from the volunteer wheat. Uh, I wouldn't have expected that because there's a clear strip. Um, it's eight inches clear of the wheat, and I didn't think that would affect the early corn growth, but it did. There's more plant to plant variability where the wheat is heavier. So that's something to consider when using cover crops with strip till is uh, it can it can create competition and can create some negative impacts. Um, so that will be something that we think about more in the future. And we'll just do the last video. Uh, so we're just digging between the strip. So this would be untilled ground. Uh, it had cover crop last fall and on the strip. And so we're just comparing the soil aggregation, uh, soil structure. So you can see in the unworked ground, like there's lots of oat and wheat roots in there and it's pretty nice aggregation, wormholes, compared to on the strip. You don't see quite as much for wormholes. There's a few starting and there's, the roots are not quite as prominent, I would say. So the structure is probably not quite as nice, but uh, yeah, we're not, at, at the time of planting, this between the strips was way too wet. And so I think it's sort of, ideally, in the end, you, we are compromising the soil structure on the strips a little bit, but hopefully two thirds of the field we're leaving alone. And so hopefully we're doing more good than evil. So. So that was quite surprising actually when we went out into the field to see the stark contrast between um, on the strip and beside the strip. It was, yeah, really nice structure between and you wouldn't think so. It's a really tough field, tough piece of ground. And so to see that, I'm glad that we're not working the whole field surface. Um, I think it's moving in the right direction. So that was promising to see um, and ultimately maybe no-till is attainable if we can uh, 
if we can nurse our soil along to better help using strip till. In this field, this. Okay, we are going to go live to Thomas and Paul at the cornfield now. So if we can get them. Okay, can everyone see me? Hear me? Yeah, okay. there we are. Okay, so we're in a uh, cornfield in Bruce County near Concordia. Uh, nice field of corn. We're just we're at R and G R G and G Farms, which is Thomas Farrell's family dairy farm. So we'll just swap around. So there, there is their barn, and they have robots, right? Now. Yeah, two okay. uh, two lolly robots, compost packer, bedding the cattle in here. So uh, hi again, everybody. Uh, so what we did in this field is this was a hay crop. So we took first cut off, and uh, then we came in. We put. Uh, 5,500 gallons the acre of liquid dairy manure on it. And then we strip tilled through that right, well, a day later, once it had dried on, we uh, made some beautiful strips. We've got a uh, gladiator as well, just like Adam and Paul. Uh, shanks though, we don't run uh, coulters. So we made some beautiful strips, took a lot of power strip tilling through the alfalfa though. Then we rolled it with our land roller and followed with the corn planter all within about 24 hours of putting the manure on. So we got beautiful emergence, on, or I should say we planted May 28th for this field. Beautiful emergence, everything was looking really good off the start, and then we got a half inch of rain right after planting, and then we got nothing until last week. So we had beautiful emergence, everything, and then it stalled out. And uh, now we've got knee high corn almost, and it's starting to look pretty promising again. We used uh, uh, Callisto for control of the alfalfa, and then we followed back about a week and a half later with another shot at glyphosate. It uh, looks like we got a control of the alfalfa at this point, and uh, corn's coming along really well. The goal with this corn is for silage for this fall. So we're just trying to maximize the acres here and take uh, push as much feed off these acres as we can that are close to the dairy barn. Uh, for comparison, here's some uh, corn that was planted on April 24th. So you can see we're a fair ways behind, but I think we have lots of time still to make a, a pretty good crop. See the uh, pretty decent root structure. So hopefully we're looking at some pretty good corn yields now that we got some moisture, but we're still needing another rain here at King Carden. So hopefully we get something again pretty soon. Perfect, back to you, Adam. Okay. Okay, so just for a bit of discussion, this is an experience we had this past fall. Um, shows some of the ugly side of strip tilling. Um, so on the left, you can see um, the strip. So we tried to make this uh, Thanksgiving, and so it had rained a bunch um, and was starting to dry out, but the ground was still obviously not perfect conditions, um, but we figured we'd try and make some strips and let the frost work on it through the winter. Um, an interesting thing that I happened upon was the strip tiller. Um, I was hanging out over the soybean field. So on the right hand picture, you can see the line where there's um, the oak cover crop. And then to the right, it's soybean stubble with no cover crop. And so you can see the slot in the oak cover crop and then it actually made an ice berm in the soybeans. So that really jumped out to me. Um, just another, I think the cover crops have a lot of value, but they do add some complication to the system. And so it takes 
some thought to figure out how to make that work. We're considering blocking off a run or two in our drill when we plant the oat after uh, wheat, and then we can strip till into those spots. So every 30 inches, we block off some runs and uh, just put tillage radish in those areas. Um, here's some pictures of fall strips. Uh, these were stale seed bed. So we made these earlier in the summer. And uh, then on the right hand side is after planting. So we planted straight into the stale strips in this case. We did not refresh it. Adam, there's a question from the floor. Okay, yeah, and now would be a good time actually to, to have a bit of discussion. Thanks. So Matt Ververs asked, what was the fall strip till date you did where you got the slot effect? That was uh, Thanksgiving. So that, it was a little earlier this year. It was October, I don't know, I'd say 12th or something like that. Or somewhere around the 12th. Was there any other questions right now before we go back to the slideshow? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. And I got a couple here for you. Uh, first of all, you're, you're sowing oats after the wheat. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. Uh, cover crop. And you're drilling that into the wheat. And what rate are you going in at? 40 pounds of oats and we just use bin run oats okay are you uh have you been doing any uh red clover on your wheat at all have you had any success with that we have we gave up for a few years this year this spring we broadcast red clover into a few wheat fields to try again we got a better spreader i think we we're hoping to try it again, maybe for a couple of years. I think we're going to try to continue to up the rate a little bit. We've heard people have more success with a little higher rate. So typically we would have been five pounds and there's people pushing closer to 10 pounds with the red clover. So we are trying it, but we don't have much experience. Paul, I guess you have a bit of experience with red clover. Yeah, we and the, the biggest thing from what we have learned on our farm is that we need to in the in the in the summer we need like after wheat harvest when we get a chance we need to install the strips because as it gets later in the fall on our heavy land we just have the slotting issue so we need to come in and get the red clover out of the strip and the coon the coon machine i would say makes probably one of the narrowest berms that that i've seen so it is a fairly narrow little berm um, so we're not just, we're not disturbing that much red clover, but it's very important because if you don't have the red clover out of there, it's pretty tough to make nice strips once the roots get big. Okay, uh, one my one comment is, uh, you said you uh, had did uh, five pounds and you were looking at going to higher ten. I typically use six and a half. But uh, anything that I've researched in, I've uh, taken it up to 12, had no better results. Uh, I've always run with red clover and just blown another 35 pounds on oats. And we strip, we strip till in the, in the spring only because any, my research hasn't proved to be any value in the fall. And I always question why uh, you're using the, not the colder, but the knife. Uh, on Thomas's farm there, he used the knife in the springtime. And I would have thought that would have left uh, some air pockets in, within the strip that would have caused uh, some challenges for you, Thomas. So those are three thoughts that somebody can come, come back and comment on. Before we do, just curious what your soil type is, because I think that has a big impact too on shank versus boulder. Uh, we're, we're in a, a loam soil, but I've always wondered why people in clay 
want to go deeper and not just run uh, a coulter. Have you ever just tried coulters in the springtime? I, I, so we do do some just spring only and like the gladiator is not, it's not a colder machine. We just build colders for it. Um, but the biggest thing that I've seen is that if, if you try to go into our ground with a colder, once it starts getting hard, like the clay is the brick factory, not that far away. Yeah. The clay, we, we just can't get the colders in very well in the clay. So I would say that's especially on in a no-till scenario um in between the strips is just so hard in the spring um like i i think we would struggle on the heavy farms okay. so yeah. edu educate me one little moment what would happen if you went in with a serrated coulter in the spring when the soil's damp and get right back in there with the planter before it's dried yeah. Not on clay. Yeah, that, that probably works in our area. That probably works on 50, 60, 70 percent of the field, and then 30 percent of the field would just be an absolute disaster. Like the and tough clay knolls. When we say clay, we mean like, yeah, what you make bricks out of. We put on six inches, you can spin your tires and not sink all day. <laughs> we, um, I actually have a, I have a slide later on showing the compaction from. Uh, the spring when everyone else was out doing conventional tillage and we just had to wait and I, I would say we're further ahead now but patience definitely pays on some of our grounds. Yeah I would say uh, there was a time when I agreed that Coulter was what I wanted to have here then we got a coon around in the spring and tried it out with a shank and we found as long as you're picky about when you go in that the Coulter actually is an excellent job with the clay and it gets in the ground because we have penetration issues otherwise. So yeah, yeah. We also we roll hundred percent of our strips before we plant them. And a lot of that is about sealing it back down and squeezing out here. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for your no questions and comments. That's I mean, I think that's getting to the core of like some of the that some of the big challenges of strip hurdles and a lot of learning. With strip for sure. Adam, there's another Any question other from the floor. Um, okay. Matt, Matt says, and this is to Paul, doing an early fall strip in red clover, have you found it grows back to the strip by late fall? I, I would, um, we, we have very, like we do have a bit of root growth in through the sides of the strips, but we don't have huge like we still have a bit kind of a bare strip in the center and then the red clover kind of like the red clover will fill in the entire field but the actual plants aren't in the strip anymore it's just essentially just keeping that strip without plants in it and without red clover in it i should say because we put oats down to grow on the strip for the erosion purposes great Good questions and stuff. And remember, if anyone does have questions or comments, you can always just type it in and one of us will read your question for you if that's what you'd like. Great. We're just gonna go back to the PowerPoint and yeah, we'll come back to questions. Um, this is a little bit I think a land roller is in general a useful tool strip tilling. Um, partly for the spring, if you do make spring strips, you can squeeze the air out of it and get it level. We actually found this year that some of our strips we made in the summer were probably like four inches high still this spring, mm -hmm. higher than we kind of wanted them. And actually the planter was falling off of the strips. And what we did is we took the land roller over them and they flattened out by two inches and made sort of a flat top on them. And then the planter would sit on top of them. It makes it far easier to find all your strips while it freshens up the soil on top. I don't think we We'll just skip this video. It's just talking about the rolling. Oh, 
Okay, so on our farm, we do do a mix of spring and fall. Um, sorry, we do spring only and fall with spring strip freshening. So um, I would say generally any fall strips are done on heavier land. And it's, it's essentially just to get a berm there and built so that we can hopefully get a few a day or two earlier corn planting in the spring. Um, so the spring only is done on loam or lighter soils. So our cover crops are um, cover crop of oats, radish, sunflower, and some red clover, depending on farms. And some farms get beef manure at about 10 metric tons of the acre. Some farms, the straw is spread and some is baled. And P and K is broadcast with cover crop on spring only. And the P and K is banded on fall strips with the Montag and the shanks. So the spring holders, um, we built, uh, because it's not a colter machine, we built an attachment that kind of blows the fertilizer in front of the twin colters and it gets blended quite nice. So all the farms, to keep it simple, um, get 300 pounds of 23.2, 16.3, 8.3, with 4.3 of sulfur and 0.72 of zinc. So we get about 68 to 70 units of actual N, and the side dressing is general, generally scheduled for mid-June. And we did, we actually, on some of the last stuff, we just finished side dressing this morning. So so we have, we run a Coon, Coon Gladiator strip till with a Montag fertilizer cart. And our planter is equipped with hydraulic downforce for planting. So uh, I just have a couple of videos similar to what Adam has. Um, so here's just a history of the spot we're in. We have a C, CEC of over 20 in this area, uh, 150 pounds of of 1.7, 8.3, 51 broadcast with 50 pounds of oats. And this field did have red clover. So we got some tiling done. So basically the oats are just to fill in any poor spots of red clover. Um, 125 pounds of 6.5, 31.4, 23.7 applied in the strip. And then one liter 540 glyphosate uh, with on guard and 0.25 liter atrazine at spike stage. So here is a video. I'm Paul Legg, and we're just in some strip till fields. So we run a Coon Gladiator 16 row. Um, so we run shanks in the fall, which this was after wheat. So it had um, red clover broadcast. You can see the residue right here from the wheat. And then was strip tilled at the end of September. And so we also did some tiling. So we broadcast oats on the entire farm and leveled the tile runs out. So a mixture, there was some oats that came throughout the whole farm. What you see here is a fall strip with a shank and then we have coulters that we come in and blend the fertilizer. So we put uh, 300 pounds of a starter blend, um, mostly urea. We banded the P and K last fall and then just have a, a small little bit of P and K in it for the spring. So Anyways, as you can see, we hit the strip in here and the corn is coming pretty good. This is a, this is a fairly heavy, heavy farm. Um, we have some nicer land up there. And with the variable rate planting strip that we have, uh, we're up 36,000 seeds and then we're back down to around 33 down in this. So basically, um, I would say, I would say basically the reason we got into strip tilling was because we were 
pretty well ready to give up growing corn on some of the heavy farms. <laughs> there, uh, we were just getting frustrated. Like it's, it was just so tough on really tough farms to grow um, decent corn. So that would be, this is showing on, like this is a farm that we would not have wanted to grow corn on probably. So you just have another video showing some of the soil structure. I'm Paul Lag, and we're just in. So we're just looking at the soil aggregation in between the strip as well as on the strip here too. So this is in between the strip and this is fairly heavy ground, but you can see it's breaking up quite nicely. Um, you can see the residue from the wheat, whatever, there wasn't much red clover right in here. But some pretty nice, nice big wormholes and, or tillage, could be tillage radish too, in some of these spots. That we did on this field. Um, so we get, you can see the picture on the far right, you can see some of the better corn and then in some of the heavier ground, um, at the, on the right hand picture, the two top corn plants are in kind of nicer soil. And then the uh, bottom plant is in a little bit of a, a tougher chunk. So anyways, you can see the picture on the left that our roots are finding the strip. They are going down in the center. So. Um, yeah. So, so we have um, just right in here where this is a video, but I won't play it. Um, but basically, this is a really tough kind of spot. We, when we retiled the farm, we had to run um, a 12 inch main through here, but we had to strip it off with the excavator. And it has not grown much of anything for, well, three or four years like it's just tough just to get something growing in it. it just always seems like it's too wet every time you go through it and it just compounds the problem so in you can see that we finally have some plants growing and they they're about a leaf behind um some of the better corn close by but at least we finally have something growing in All right, so uh, we usually plant our corn crop after winter wheat. We, after our winter wheat crop, we generally grow a nine-way cover crop mix, roughly. The other thing we do do after is grow sorghum on some of the acres for heifer feed. Uh, once we have the cover crop mix established, we spread five to 6,000 gallons the acre of liquid dairy manure on our farms that are closer to the home farm. Ones that are further away, we also have a composting dairy barn. So we, uh, we haul all of our solid manures to farms further away to try to get manure over as many of the farms as possible in, uh, in our three-year rotation. Uh, covers are usually terminated in the fall, but we're starting to try out leaving more cover into the spring. And so far we're having good luck with it, but uh, learning lots at the same time. So we will continue to primarily terminate in the fall. A uh, one pass with our strip till unit, either in the spring or the fall. The heavier farms should be strip tilled in the fall. And we had a little bit of an experience on that because I will not strip till a hill either in the fall, like a hilly field in the fall. And we left a very heavy farm to the spring this year. And it, we made the mistake of spreading the straw on it just because we had so much straw last year that uh, we decided we blow the last field down. And it was a real problem trying to get it to dry out enough live and learn, I guess. So uh, we use the exchange both spring and fall as we touched on earlier. We have primarily spring strips this year, but uh, we'll be going back into more fall strips in the future here too. So uh, we plant on stale strips where it's in the fall, which works excellent for us. The biggest thing we got to find with that is that it does take time to dry out down a few inches at your planting zone. So patience is very important. 
before you roll in and go. A uh, land roller over all of our strips before we plant spring or fall, it just makes a very big difference. Uh, we run a two by two band on our corn planter, place uh, 225 pounds of a 10.8, 10.4, 24.3 with nine sulfur and 0.2 zinc. Uh, it's been working very well for us. And then the rest of our nitrogen, we apply through 28%. Uh, generally up front, but uh, we're starting to play with more nitrogen timing as well. Uh, we use Converge for herbicide as a residual in the spring. And then we usually come back in and clean up with Liberty as a uh, trying to mix up our uh, chemical and not rely too heavily on glyphosate. So here's some pictures. Uh, the picture on the left is a picture that was into a fall terminated nine way cover crop mix. Uh, plant a very nice great emergence. Uh, the picture on the right is actually into spring terminated rye that was planted on alternating 15 inch rows. I think we got a little bit more on that coming up here. Yeah, here we are. So this is something we tried for the first time this spring. Last year, this was in hay after second cut we terminated the hay and we drilled a mix of uh, sorghum, faba beans, soybeans, and cereal rye through it. We put uh, sorghum in 15 inch rows and alternated the other two, other three things in the other rows. Uh, we got a nice cut of feed off that and when we, we fed it with a liquid dairy manure as well. We uh, then left the rye to overwinter because this is a rolly field, as you can see, and I wanted some erosion control as well as keeping some life into the spring. We only have about 10 pounds of rye on this. So this was, uh, what was this, uh, April 24th that this picture was taken. Uh, planted, worked up beautiful, planted beautiful, and uh, that corn plant I showed earlier was actually came out of this field. It, uh, it's never looked back. So the picture on the left, that's a picture of down at the strip in between the rye rows. And we were able to drop the strip till in between the rows. So we didn't get any rye in the rows. And then we terminated actually the day after planting. The reason I did that is there was a mixed forecast and I was afraid to kill the rye and not get it planted. So we went the other way around. The picture on the right hand side here, that's uh, some cover crop that I left through the winter of our nine way mix. And that's what it looked like planting at this spring. Uh, the picture on the left, that's the uh, cover crop that was spring terminated from the last picture as it was uh, dying and the corn was emerging. The picture on the right, that's the other picture with the field with the rye where we planted. Uh, we're under what we've learned. <clears throat> so yeah, if um, we could do some questions too, but yeah. So, oh, I guess <laughs> I have a question that was texted to me. Uh, the question is, do you manually follow the strip with the planter? Uh, we've, we've done both actually. Um, we, we are, so we strip till on our DK so we can uh, use the same line spring and fall. Um, the, the planter tractor we're only running wide or uh, loss on. So we do have some issues, but we, I was having issues, not this spring, but the previous spring. Um, I actually manually steered most of the corn planting and it, it seems overwhelming when you start, but once you get used to it, it as, especially spring, spring strips, um, it's, it's actually pretty easy to follow. So if, if it's done with RTK, I would say. We, we put everything through GPS well. Uh, unfortunately, not RTK as, as of yet, but uh, we're all GPS, as many uh, strips or lines, I should say, transfer between tractors through uh, the John Deere system. It's nice and easy. Uh, so my brother can lay the strip and he can send it to the cloud. We can send it back out to the other tractor and pick it up and plant back into it. Uh, we try to do headlands with uh, guidance whenever we can, but I will manually drive the headlands if I have to. We're on a uh, eight row strip till in a 12 row planter. So guidance becomes fairly important. Yeah. Uh, 
we are we have RTK on the strip pillar and the planter. Um, we got the second unit to RTK for strip till last year. We didn't have it, and we weren't full strip till yet. So we just um, were match eight row and eight row. But we also uh, plant our soybeans all between the corn rows, 15 inch rows, and we straddle the corn row. So we need the accuracy for that anyways. So we just look for every way that we can cut other costs and make it pay. Um, so that's our strategy. It is a chunk of money to have the subscriptions, but basically we take the approach of trying to make it pay using every way we can. Um, one thing I would mention is that both Adam and Thomas have a three point hitch strip tiller. We actually have a, a like a trail unit. And I would like, we were worried. There's a lot of people that run like um, implement guidance and stuff. And we were a little worried when we first started, but actually the, the strip tiller is the same distance from the tractor on the toolbar or on the hitch as the planter is and it actually follows very well i think if we had we the tractor steers the outside rounds and i think if we had rtk on the planter it would probably follow pretty well Sorry. is there any more questions on that so i'll just talk while while gerard had mentioned about um thinking the coulters would work better. Like this picture on the right hand side was showing. So we had finished all the loam and light land and we came to this farm that looked good <laughs> on the surface. And um, I, I wasn't, I didn't think it was fit to go, but I thought, well, we'll try it. And what you can see there is actually the coulter just slotting in, in the trench. So regardless what it looked like, um, we were creating sidewall compaction with the coulters on the strip tiller. So we sat for almost three days before this was finally fit um, to strip till. And then we, I mean, patience pays once we stripped it and it planted very nice. So. But um, just going over things that we have learned Hydraulic downforce, it's not a necessity. We just got it this year. Um, what happens if we miss the strip with downforce is that the planter actually has a chance to get the corn in into like down into the ground in decent condition. Um, what we found before when we just had spring pressure, we didn't want to run a whole lot of down pressure in the strips because we can create sidewall compaction and things. But if we got off the strip, you could really see it because we were planting way too shallow. Um, what happens in our case in particular though, if we miss the strip, say coming into the corner, because our nitrogen is only in the strip, we will have, well, when Adam and I went out doing videos, everything looked pretty good. As soon as it stayed dry and root growth is restri restricted, the the plants started yellowing like anything that was off the strip. Um, so that's something to look out for. I mean, if if you're expecting perfection, this may not be for you. That's what I said. <laughs> meaning, meaning in in the system, like can the conventional system, if if it's not perfect, you can just work the field again. Um, we don't really have that option in this. So. You want pretty and easy conventional is that. <laughs> Strip till has a lot of benefits though, if you keep with it and you learn the, the tricks or start learning them. It, I'm not gonna say I've learned them all. There's a lot more for, more for me to learn, so. I think the other comment would be that over time we are seeing our soil structures changing and the soil is changing so some of those heaviest some of those heaviest clay knolls are um, are changing and are getting more tilt to them um, with not being fully worked every even every third year in corn um, that 
that was kind of the goal going ahead. Like, even when you disc in a conventional system or in a minimum kill system, when you're spring disking or spring tillage, those knolls take like four passes, probably plus a packer a few times to get them beat into shape. And so that's where we're hoping to get the hybrid system where you get a strip made in the fall, the frost works on those uh, knolls, let nature do the fine tillage. And then you can uh, you have something much more workable, almost as if it's uh, fall mold or cloud. Yeah, yeah, you can basically plant in the spot of ground if you do it that way. And you're not resetting. If you're going into with your plow or your disc rip or something, you're, you kind of always hold yourself in a state of transition. Where, whereas if you go into strip till, we've been finding that the soil heals and it starts to change through time that way. I have a, a question for one of you or all of you, uh, what, is it, what is the width of your strips when you're done? And, and uh, what width of gauge wheels are you running with on your planters? Sorry, was that what width are the strips? Yeah, and then what width are the gauge wheels or the planter? I, I would say like our machine, I would say six, seven inches wide probably. Yeah, I, maybe up to eight. I'd say seven to eight in good condition. But if you get into some tough stuff, you're a little narrower than that. But the goal is seven to eight, I would say. Yeah. And and I would like there is a lot of machines that are ten or more, which definitely would take some more guesswork out of it. But um, I don't know. That's that's the piece of equipment that we're using, so we have to deal with it, I guess. And then the game. Um, we're like we're running standard three inch, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm standard too. I've been considering moving the narrow gauge wheels, but I haven't done it yet. What's your experience with that chart? Uh, our strips are running about six, seven inches wide, and the standard gauge wheel, I believe, is about four inches. And uh, last year, we got a set of two and three quarter inch gauge wheel and really like like it uh, the planter just rides that much smoother and uh, our uh, ground co ground contact and uh, the ride has greatly improved on it we do not uh, roll our fields in any way though uh, I strip it uh, uh, this year we stripped three days in advance other years, we're just stripping uh, uh, right in front of the planter or wherever, four hours in front. Uh, but I'd like to, once I get that strip on a normal year, I like to get the, it closed up uh, and uh, sealed up after. I have one other question. Somebody uh, was talking, we're going back to talking uh, red clover. Uh, and I'm going to throw the thought out here. Uh, I really like red clover and oats. Uh, just burning red clover, uh, the red clover and oats off with uh, a glyphosate without any dicamba in the future and hoping I don't kill the red clover and almost have a, a green cover crop somewhat growing over the winter. Any comments? No, I think... I think the biggest, like, it's only good if you can have green crop growing over the winter as far as soil health. The biggest issue would be on the clay ground. That would be my biggest concern um, to be able to get it work. Just those roots hold so much moisture and the clay is just unworkable at that point. Depends on your full plan and what, what your plan for the spring is with it. I had planned on doing something similar last year. I haven't grown clover and six years. I did do a little bit last year as a trial, but it didn't catch. So, uh, yeah, I, I, uh, I will probably be trying more in the future though. I would say while I like the idea of having the red clover still producing nitrogen <laughs> in the spring as well. Um, I, I think that we would struggle 
like we we have done it before and i don't know if you're on the bruce county soil and crop tour um we had strip tilled when we were demoing the machine um and we had left some strips and red clover is so hard to kill in the spring um we i i, I guess you should, i guess i can but it does work not bad on it but it just grows so rapidly the second year um i i'd be a little bit worried on our land that's all there's yeah different people trying that and woody than our clover is uh yeah i i might i know he moved away from the red polio to recruit to the presently he's on to uh uh, I don't want to say which one for sure. He's moved off with right forward for some of the other folks. So, so we're at 820 now. I think um, we don't want to hold people up if they have to get going to different places. So we could call sort of an official end to the official meeting, but we certainly would be happy to continue the conversation if there's questions and comments. We'd love to hear other people's experiences with uh, strip till and even with uh, planting green and uh, so I think uh, yeah bring your questions on but if you have to duck out go ahead it's a pleasure to have you here we appreciate you joining us um, thank you Lori for all your help as always well, huge okay. thank you to uh, all three of you you did an outstanding job lots of information shared and I think everyone enjoyed it thoroughly Okay, we just have a thank you here. Yeah, <laughs> there's our official thank you slide. <laughs> so we just wanted to thank Thomas and his family for hosting us here as well. We just kind of, Adam and I kind of just shoved it on them. So <laughs> it was good on them to let us do it. Um, yeah, the virtual crop tour, thanks, thanks to the virtual crop tour team for pulling this together in the 11th hour as usual. Um, our sponsors for making this all possible. Lori and Gray Ag Services, thanks for all your help today and always. <laughs> Justine Lennox and Gray SCIA for paving the way on the virtual series. And OSCIA for all the tech to pull it together. And all of our members, everyone that, that listened and took an interest in the content. Thank you. We look forward to uh, doing an in-person event with Scriptville sometime in the future. I think there's a lot of interest in it and it would be great to continue learning from each other. I'm going to stop recording in case that was preventing people from talking, but I want uh, you guys to carry on if you have the time and ask more questions or provide comment about what it's like to strip till on your farm. But I'm going to stop recording at this very moment.